Good afternoon, this is Vicar Joe Pinzel coming to you from Zion Lutheran Church in Wausau, Wisconsin. We are going through the book of Galatians, and so your word in the middle of this week is from Galatians chapter 3. But before we begin with that, I'd like to just review for a moment of what we've been discussing. Remember, the problem here with the Galatian churches is that many of them had been led astray by individuals who counted their righteousness to be in works of the law. So what that means is they were saying that it was necessary for these Christians in Galatia, in this region of, of now, that's now um, southeastern Turkey, that they had to do specific things. They had to follow the the Torah, essentially. They had to be circumcised. They had to do certain things so that they might be considered believers, that they might be considered faithful. In order to show that they were faithful, they had to do something. And St. Paul is saying that this endangers the gospel. It endangers the gospel because it, it minimizes the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. It minimizes what Jesus Christ himself does through you by making you righteous as the propitiation for our sins or as the one who stands between you and God to be your righteousness, to be the one that gives us salvation, not your works, but Jesus. And so we continue on this week with some supporting arguments that St. Paul puts out here. So let's begin with Galatians 3 verse 1. O foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? It was before your eyes that Jesus Christ was publicly portrayed as crucified. Let me ask you this. Did you receive the Spirit by the works of the law or by hearing with faith? Are you so foolish, having begun by the Spirit? Are you now being perfected by the flesh? Did you suffer so many things in vain, if indeed it was in vain? Does he who supplies the Spirit to you and works miracles among you do so by works of the law or by hearing with faith, just as Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him as righteousness? As we hear in Romans chapter 10, verse 17, faith comes through hearing and hearing through the word of Christ. This is one of uh, Luther's favorite spots to go to. It's one of, also one of my personal favorites. That's why in the newsletter I always sign it, Fides ex Audi 2, faith comes through hearing in Latin. And uh, St. Paul lifts that up again here. Did you receive the Spirit by the works of the law or by hearing with faith? Now, what does the Spirit do for us? The Spirit actually kindles in us that faith. It allows us to believe that Jesus Christ actually is our righteousness and that, oh, by the way, he has saved you. He has given you eternal life. Without the Holy Spirit, without the word of God speaking to you, you would not believe. As Luther says in uh, the third article of the Creed in his small catechism, I believe that I cannot believe, but by the power of the Holy Spirit, God has called, gathered, and collected me into his one true church. Um, and so the Holy Spirit, you know, a lot of people say that Lutherans are pretty weak on the Holy Spirit, which just simply isn't true. It all works together for faith in that one man who saved you, Jesus Christ. And it has a great deal of power. Does he who supplies the Spirit to you and works miracle am miracles among you do so by works of law or by hearing with faith? So we can see that God has been working in these places and he's been working through the spirit that kindles within us that saving faith in Jesus Christ. And then he does something really interesting in verse six. He goes behind the law. So the law given to Moses was a little bit after some of the earlier patriarchs. If you remember who came before Moses, I think Abraham did come before Moses. And so we look back to Genesis 15, where God creates a covenant with Abram. At this time, his name was Abram. And he says this in chapter 15, verse 5. Look toward heaven and number the stars, if you are able to number them. Then he said to him, so shall your offspring be. And he believed the Lord, Abraham that is, and he counted it to him as righteousness. So, Righteousness didn't come through works of the law originally. In the covenant with Abram, Abraham, 
it came through belief, believing in the word of God. And as we hear, the word of God sends us, sends to us the Holy Spirit, which turns our hearts towards Christ and to faith. This is a very important thing in the Lutheran church in specific. And this is also our heritage. So let us continue on with verse 7. Know then that it is those of faith who are the sons of Abraham. And the scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, Preach the gospel beforehand to Abraham, saying, In you shall all the nations be blessed. So then those who are of faith are blessed along with Abraham, the man of faith. And this is also important because remember what Barnabas had done, right? He had started to go off with the circumcision party, uh, the, the party that, that Peter was kind of giving lip service to. And St. Paul is directly refuting that here. He's refuting that you are a descendant of Abraham if you are circumcised or if you're Jewish enough uh, by the flesh, by works of the flesh. And as far as St. Paul is concerned, well, that's all just bogus. Because which came first, circumcision or faith? Faith, the covenant, the belief in the word of God. So let us continue on. For all who rely on the works of the law are under a curse, for it is written, Cursed be everyone who does not abide by all things written in the book of the law and do them. Now it is evident that no one is justified before God by the law, for the righteous shall live by faith. But the law is not of faith. Rather, the one who does them shall live by them. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone who hanged on a tree, so that in Christ Jesus the blessing of Abraham might come to the Gentiles, so that we might receive the promised spirit through faith. Receiving that promised Holy Spirit, which draws us to the salvation of Christ through faith. So an important, an important distinction is made here, contrasting uh, the works of the law and the righteousness that comes through faith. Something that Luther says in the Heidelberg Disputation, it's, it's a lovely quote. He says, the law says, do this, and it is never done. The gospel, the promise, says, believe this, and it is already done for you. And I think that's the distinction. This is the law gospel distinction that you're always hearing in your Lutheran congregations. Uh, the law really holds in front of you a mirror and by nature will accuse you because we are imperfect. We are sinful beings. Uh, none is righteous, as Romans says, not even one. We have all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Right. And so when you hear the law, the Ten Commandments, and you review your life according to them, OK, you know, honor thy father and mother, the, the fourth commandment. Well, how often do we really do that? Do not steal, do not commit adultery. Those sins go on every day. And even if they're not committed externally, they also hold it up to your heart. Right. So the law accuses and it says, do this, do these things, be perfect. And it's never done. The gospel, on the other hand, the good news of Jesus Christ says, believe this, believe in what I have done. And all of this is already done for you. The law is fulfilled by your faith, by believing in the one who is the fulfillment of the law. Jesus took upon himself all of our sin, all of the curse, all of our inadequacies, the things that we couldn't do by works of the law. And he completed it. He became the curse. He became all sin and death so that by his death, that accusation actually might die too. The threat of death, the wages of sin is death and the power of sin is the law, right? So we hold to Jesus Christ who gives us our righteousness and the promised spirit through faith. Let's uh, move on to skip ahead a little bit to verse 21, actually verse 19 through 20. Let's go 19 through 20. Why then the law? It was added because of transgressions until the offspring should come to whom the promise has been made. And it was put in place through angels by an intermediary. Now an intermediary implies more than one, but God is one. 
So why do we need the law? Why did Moses give the law to his people? Why did God give the law to Moses? Well, it was added because of our transgressions until the offspring should come whom the promise had been made. There are different functions of the law. You know, it, it keeps you in order. It keeps those in civilized society from harming others. And, you know, there's also a third use that where it's to admonish Christians uh, to really be Christian, um, to uh, essentially, you know, look to the law and evaluate how you've been living as a Christian. Uh, that third use is a little little bit uh, contested because it's a little bit redundant in the sense that Jesus Christ fulfills the law. Again, we're talking about faith here. You know, if we want to be good Christians, we believe in Jesus Christ and we trust then, it's a radical trust that Jesus Christ would actually fulfill the law through the things that he inspires us to do. In some ways, we're hardly aware of the good works that we're doing. We're not thinking as we are, as we are going out and helping the poor. I'm being a good Christian, so I'm doing this. I'm getting closer to God by doing this. We just do them because Jesus Christ has given us faith. And by his Holy Spirit, that's how we live. Let's move on to verse 21 then through 24. Is the law then contrary to the promises of God? Certainly not. For if a law had been given that could give life, then righteousness would indeed be by the law. But the scripture imprisoned everything under sin, so that the promise by faith in Jesus Christ might be given to those who believe. This reveals the dire need for the Messiah. In every place before Jesus Christ, the people were yearning for this because they knew as much as close as they could follow the law to the very letter, it wasn't giving them life. And history would show that that's the case, right? I mean, they're an oppressed people. And because it wasn't giving them life, they hoped for a Messiah to come who would guarantee them life, who would give them the the land promised to them, who would fulfill the covenant that God had made with Abraham. We believe that Jesus Christ has done that. He has given life for those who believe. Moving on to verse 25 through 29. But now that faith has come, we are no longer under a guardian, the law. For in Christ Jesus, you are all sons of God through faith. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is no male and female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you are Christ's, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to the promise. Something I think that's important to point out here is... The argument made in verse 28, where he says, there's neither Jew nor Greek, there's neither slave nor free, there's neither male nor female, but all are one in Christ Jesus, is according to the status that some would claim. Remember, think about it in your own lives. If somebody is doing good works and they put their faith in their good works and they say, I'm doing this because I want to be a good Christian. Well, then those individuals who don't do those good works are, are kind of put in a tier below them, right? So it develops a hierarchy, you know, who's being the best person, essentially, and showing that they are the best Christian. St. Paul wants to eradicate this because, remember, you know, Peter was sitting at the table with those who would abide by the law, and they were sitting separately. This was splitting communities down the middle and adding a lot of disruptive and destructive social dynamics to it. So what St. Paul wants to argue in saying there's neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, there's neither male nor female for all are one in Christ Jesus. He's saying that in the eyes of faith, you're all one. That is, if you believe that Jesus Christ took upon himself the sin of the world, 
was crucified and died for you and is risen to say, peace be with you, I forgive you, then you are all on equal footing with God. It's, it's a status thing. It's not saying that there is no distinction, that, that all cultural distinctions are wiped out and that somehow we're all androgynous gender-wise. It's to say that creation is still upheld. God's laws are still upheld. But now they're upheld in Jesus Christ. We know what it means to be a man or a woman because Jesus Christ would tell us so. And we know what it means to be enslaved to sin because when we see the law, well, we feel imprisoned by it. We know what it means to be free according to Jesus. So it's all through Christ that we interpret these things. And if you are Christ's, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to the promise. So this ties us back to that original covenant, going behind the law, to the promise that God makes to his people, the promise that God made to the creation in speaking into it, in rendering his Holy Spirit into bodies derived from the earth. He Remember, he breathes life into the nostrils of Adam from the earth. And so then gives life. So this is the way that we are, ought to expect to receive new life. It's by believing in the word when we hear it. It's by being drawn to our Lord Jesus Christ and saying, In him only does my righteousness reside. In him only do I trust. Then we are on proper footing with God. But if you count on your own works, especially in this season, it's important to remember, counting on your own works just puts you between God. It puts your works between God, not Jesus. It puts Jesus away, right? So we always want to have the Son of God between us and God because he shows us the gracious will, the mercy and loving kindness of the Father. And for that, we can all say, Amen. May the peace of the Lord be with you.